Good morning. Um, good afternoon. Good evening. Muy buenos dias. Muy buenas noches. Buenas tardes. I, you know, I don't know when you're watching or listening to this presentation, but welcome. Welcome. Bienvenidos to Business 123 Introduction to Investments 2022. All of us at Southwestern Community College are very happy, grateful, proud, and honored that you decided to uh, take our class. Whether officially enrolled or not, <laughs> we value all our students, no matter where they are in this crazy old world. My name is Frank Paiano. You can call me Frank or Paco. This is my students at San Isidro who didn't want to call me Frank. They didn't mind calling me Paco or Senor Paquito. <laughs> Ay, Paquito, es es difícil. Um, but you can call me Mr. P sometimes, Frank uh, Paiano. It's Italiano. My official title is Professor Emeritus, which <laughs> fancy, schmancy. It just means I've retired from full time teaching and now I teach part time and they get to pay me less. I'm in the School of Business and Technology, and I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I introduced myself somewhere else, but this is um, the uh, financial, uh, part of the financial program here in the School of Business and Technology. My website is wonderprofessor.com. So no matter what's going on with Canvas or the college website or whatever, you can always go to wonderprofessor.com and keep working. Welcome everyone. We are so grateful that you're here. And we're going to do our best to make this the best class you have ever taken. And I know that sounds a little uh, over the top, but it is sincere. It is. That's our goal. Okay. And we don't want to hear if you're not happy with the course. We want to hear if you're happy with the course, please tell us too. Let's get started with a perspective. It is a gloomy moment in history. Never has the future seemed so dark and incalculable. The United States is beset with racial, industrial, and commercial chaos drifting we know not where. Of our troubles, no one can see the end. Uh, so did you see this on Skunk News last night or last Tuesday? Um, uh, Weasel News. Badger News. The Fox News, right. Fox News with the with the... Communist Democrats taking over and destroying our country. Folks, if you ask people when this was created, when this was said, when this was written, they will typically say Great Depression, World War II, maybe 9-11, maybe the global financial catastrophe, global financial crisis of 2008-9. No, it was a lot earlier than that. It was actually from Harper's Magazine, a very influential magazine at the time, 1847. <laughs> yeah, right before the nation was about to tear itself apart in the Civil War over our original sin of slavery. Did they have serious issues in the 1840s? Serious problems? Yes. Yes, they did. Do we have serious problems now in the... 2020s? Yes, we do. Uh -huh. But so far, equating serious with fatal has been um, incorrect. In fact, economically, financially, with regard to investments, I'm very optimistic about the next 20, 30 years. The last 200 years, the last 20 years have been the most successful prosperous financial years in the history of modern finance, in the history of the world finance, that, for that is. Our standard of living is so far above people who were born 100 years ago or 200 years ago or 1,000 years ago. They couldn't begin to believe how we live. And I believe the next 20, 30 years, economically, financially, with regard to investments, are going to be even better. Now, I'm scared to death about the political, but that's a different class. Go to your poli-sci instructor, professor, and ask them about all the problems that we have. 
Think about it, folks. Before the pandemia of COVID, it used to take four years at the earliest, 10 years typically, to create a vaccine. And yet multiple companies in multiple countries created multiple vaccines within six months, a year. Unheard of. The next 20 years, we're going to see technology changes that we could only dream about. The biotech world, I'm firmly convinced, is going to do, going to make what the computer and telecommunications world did look tame. And what does that mean for us investors? It means the news is pretty darn good. <laughs> if you can turn out, tune, tune out the daily uh, d disasters and catastrophes on the nightly news, in fact, the best thing to do is to turn off your television and pick up a book or, or a newspaper or a magazine. Yeah, flashing red, flashing lights are you know, really not good for us. We're not designed to, to watch them, especially late at night. Yeah, but now we all watch our cell phones, so I guess it's kind of the same. Anyway, I'm excited. I hope you are. Stick with us because we're going to show you that if you invest prudently, wisely, for the long term, don't panic. Don't get suckered into every next big thing. You should do well. But as we'll say over and over again, there are no guarantees. Slide number three. We'll start chapter one, introduction, overview, and risk versus return with a quote from J. Kenfield Morley, who really summed it up very neatly in a sentence. In investing money, the amount of interest you want should depend upon whether you want to eat well or sleep well. Now, I, I, I would switch the word interest to reward or return because interest is just one type of investment return that we receive. But still, the meaning shines through and we understand that we're going to have to make a decision. <laughs> do we want to eat well or do we want to sleep well? What we're going to learn is that we can learn techniques and concepts and skills that will help us eat reasonably well and sleep reasonably well. But there ain't no such thing as something that can get you to eat well and sleep well. It doesn't exist. <laughs> it's that simple. The eternal struggle of risk and return in the investment world. And we will return to this concept over and over and over again. We start from the very beginning, though, on slide number four, with what is an investment. An investment is any vehicle into which resources can be placed with the expectation that it will generate positive income or that its value will be preserved or increased or both. So let's pick apart this definition. We're looking at a vehicle, which is a fancy way of saying some investment product a stock, a bond, a mutual fund, and we'll learn all these terms later on, relax. And we're expecting it to generate income, maybe a real estate uh, investment, or that its value will be preserved or increased, that's the key, capital gains, or both. Growth from the capital gains, from the increase in value, and income from Dividends, interest, rent, whatever. Now, here's another definition that is going to be thrown at you throughout the semester because it comes from none other than Benjamin Graham, who was Warren Buffett, the famed investor's teacher. An investment operation is one which, upon thorough analysis, promises safety of principle and a satisfactory return. Operations not meeting these requirements are speculative. What does that word speculative mean? Well, in the investment world, speculative 
is a euphemism for gambling, rolling the dice. <laughs> and we'll come back to this idea over and over again. Are you an investor or are you a speculator? And another word for speculator is trader, T-R-A-D-E-R, trader. Because investment returns, investment re rewards come in many different flavors. As we said, income, interest, dividend, rent. Another word for that is cash flow, the cash flows. What is this, this investment going to uh, throw off in the terms of cash? And then the increased value, decreased value, capital gains, capital appreciation, yippee! Capital is a fancy word for money, for, for resources. And then, of course, there are some investments which can give us capital losses, boosts. <laughs> and so for now, in this presentation, we're going to look at some of the aspects from uh, very far away. We're going to be looking at the forest from far away, or maybe another analogy is we're in a plane way up above the landscape and we're looking down upon the aspects, the characteristics of various investments. So don't worry about all the details. Just look at what's in this presentation, what's on the study guide. There's a presentation about the study guide itself and study these terms and these ideas and these concepts. There are three major types of securities. Uh, I'm sorry, major types of investments. <laughs> I'm sorry. And the first one that we'll discuss and the one we'll discuss mostly throughout the semester are securities. Now that's a, that's a really strange, unfortunate use of the term security because many people think of you know, administration of justice, or say, you know, it's, <laughs> no, not that type of security, no. The, the, a security is an investment that represents debt or ownership or the legal right to acquire or sell the ownership interest. So if you, when you hear the term security, you can think of a financial investment, okay? And the, um, on the website and in Canvas, there's also a, and in the book, by the way, the book is free to read, there's also a link to a definition from Investopedia, which is actually a pretty good definition. I like that one also, so check that one also. Uh, but the idea is that we're investing in financial assets. The other side of the coin are property investments. You might have heard the term real estate, real property. And real is, a, again, another one of those unfortunate terms. It just means anything that is either land or connected to the land. That's what the term real means. So real estate, it means you know, stuff that's connected to the land or land itself. And then personal property, such as uh, precious metals, automobiles, art, collectibles, those can be very useful, uh, profitable investments, but usually not so. Uh, you have to be pretty savvy with regard to, to these items. And some people just enjoy collecting them. And they might actually turn out to be a good in investment. Usually not. And the third type of in investment is a personal investment. Uh, education, training, travel. We invest in ourselves. And that's what you're doing right now. By taking the time, instead of going out and having a good time, uh, you are taking the time to invest in yourself. And college is often the best investment a person will ever make. Why is that? Because it not only makes us, I believe, you know, more well-rounded individuals, more informed, better citizens, it also can increase our earning power. Hmm, did we mention that the investment world needs new professionals? That 50% of the insurance agents, 50% of the brokerage uh, uh, stock brokers, registered representatives and the like, are retiring in the next five to 10 years because we're old. And that the industry knows it needs more women, it knows it needs more minorities, bilingual, ex-military, they love veterans. And this class can be the beginning of a career for you. Think about it, you don't really need a four-year degree. We discuss it in more detail later. This class, as it says at the bottom of the slide, is that 
it concentrates on securities. That's where, for the vast majority of us, the most common alternatives, investment alternatives, will, will present to us. Why? Because most of us just don't have the time and inclination to uh, uh, do all the research it needs, f we need to do for automobiles and collectibles and, and the like. And real estate, is, as we said, is a, is a world unto itself, and it's a whole course unto itself, so that's another issue. But most of us are going to have a job, and in that job, there's going to be an opportunity to, to participate in an employer-sponsored retirement plan where we are normally asked to choose the investment alternatives, and they are securities, mostly mutual funds. So that's why we concentrate on securities. And slide number six shows that investments are also categorized by two uh, aspects, primary versus derivative. Hmm, what are these weird derivative things? Well, let's ignore them for now. Primary assets are broken down into two types, debt and equity. Debt investments are funds lent in exchange for interest income and the promised repayment of the loan at a given future date. Folks, when you invest in a savings account, you're literally loaning your money to the bank and they promise to pay you interest. Well, they're not paying you very much these days, are they? and they promise to repay your, your debt. Well, there's another type of investment called a bond where you can do the same thing. You can lend your money to these uh, large entities, corporations, state and local governments, the federal government, and they promise to repay the, the principal, just like you promise to repay the bank when you get a loan. And of course, they're going to pay you interest just as the bank wants you to pay the interest. And that's a type of investment. That's a primary debt investment. The other type where the action is, is equity, ownership. You are part owner of the enterprise, or maybe you're the full owner of the enterprise. And these are stocks, corporations, partnerships, sole proprietorships, business, real estate, and real estate investment trusts, which are a great way to invest in real estate without having to be a landlord. We'll discuss those in detail at the end of the semester. Now, the two types, the primary assets, debt and equity, are what we're, going to, what we're going to concentrate on through the semester. At the very end of the semester, we'll take a look at these bad boys here, the derivative assets. These are securities that derive their value from an underlying security or asset. Huh? They're not the investment. They point to another, and yeah, that's how it works, folks. They derive their value from some other asset. Highly speculative. Again, what does that mean? Gambling. And the two major examples are options and futures. And the real names are options contracts and futures contracts. And try to say options contracts three times fast. It's not easy. Some in the industry, your humble instructor included, do not classify derivatives as investments. According to Mr. Benjamin Graham, they don't fit his definition. They do not give us a reasonable expectation of, uh, of income and, um, and uh, holding their value or increasing their value. So they are speculative. And again, when you hear the word speculative or speculation in our class or in the investment community as a whole, what do you do? replace it with the word gambling. Now, I should come clean and tell you that there's going to be some other people who say, don't listen to Piano, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Take our three-day seminar for only $2,995. We'll show you how to become rich overnight with options. Don't listen to them. Or at least wait until the end of the semester, okay? Because then you'll be forearmed forewarned, and you'll be armed with the necessary information to tell them to go jump in a lake, preferably a very cold one. Slide number seven. Are your investments direct or indirect investments? In the case of a direct investment, your name is on the investment, and you control the investment. You can buy and sell the investment as you wish. This is real estate, stocks and bonds and 
and uh, other types of, of investments where you hold the title. Indirect investments are investments where someone else is in control of the investment. You have limited control or more likely, typically no control over the underlying investment. And that doesn't mean it's a bad investment, it's just how it's set up. The, the big one here is the mutual funds. The mutual fund does the investing for you. They decide which stocks, bonds, other types of, of, uh, of investments they're going to make for you. Uh, you can call them up and say, hey, I think you ought to buy Apple. And they'll go, thank you very much. <laughs> Hang up quickly. Real estate investment trusts. The, the company, the, it's not actually a company. They're a little tricky. It's a trust. It's a trust. But they're big. Don't worry. We'll talk about them later. But they buy the real estate. They're the ones who manage the apartment complexes and the, sh and the malls and the shopping centers. But they don't ask you which ones they should buy and sell. They, they do it for you and you reap the benefits. <laughs> Unless they do a bad job and then it doesn't do so well. And then limited partnerships are sim similar. A limited partner may have some say in what's going on, but the general partner is who is calling the shots. Now, some people get a little confused. See, but I can buy and sell my shares in the mutual fund. Right. You can sell, buy and sell your mutual fund shares, your REIT, your limited partnership shares, but, but you don't control the underlying investments. The, the uh, entities, those entities do. Okay, that's a small distinction that we need to make. Now, how about slide number eight? Here's a little bit of a subtle uh, uh, distinction that we need you to internalize now. <laughs> because it'll come back and bite you if you're not careful. The investment world is broken into three domesticities, which is a fancy word for where do they get their mail. Domestic investments are easy. They're based inside the United States. International investments mean outside the United States, also sometimes called foreign, sometimes called overseas. And global is both domestic and international. So you get it? Global means todo el mundo, all the world, whereas international means el mundo afuera de los Estados Unidos, the world outside the United States. So be very careful of this subtle distinction. And it used to be that it was very important 50, 60 years ago, but now the world is a very small place these days economically according to a, a mutual fund manager who's since retired, but he said it really well, Greg Ireland. The world is a very small place these days economically. 65% by value of the parts in the Ford Mustang come from the US and Canada. 90% of the parts in the Toyota Sienna, which is, by the way, built in Indiana, come from the US and Canada. So which is the more American car? <laughs> How can you buy a more American car than a Ford Mustang? Uh, buy a Toyota Sienna. Yeah, built in Indiana. Who has the largest car manufacturing plant in the United States? BMW. <laughs> and it's in South Carolina. <laughs> Where are most of the BMWs that are bought in the United States? built South Carolina. And up until a couple of years ago, where were most all the BMWs that were sold in Mexico built? South Carolina. They've since built a plant in Mexico. The car manufacturers learn, have learned this. The world is global. But it scares some of us, doesn't it? It does. It scares some people, especially as people get older, they get a little worried. So let's play a little game on slide nine. Domestic or foreign? Now here are all, you've heard of all these brands, right? And we want you to think, which ones are you domestic? Which ones are foreign? What do you think? You know, some of them obviously you can tell, others maybe not. And if you printed this out, you've already, <laughs> you've already know. But let's see, Budweiser. Oh, come on, Mother Bud. You can't get more American than Mother Bud. It's actually based outside the United States now. It's part of InBev, Anheuser-Busch InBev, they call it, 
Uh, it's a Brazilian-Belgian conglomeration. Yeah, okay. Shell Oil. They own most of Houston, but no, that's a foreign company. It's part of Royal Dutch Petroleum, an Anglo-Dutch uh, enterprise. That's really a country unto itself. They basically own Nigeria. How about Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream? From Vermont, it's actually now owned by Unilever, which is another multinational country, company based in, in both the UK and the Netherlands. Farmers Insurance, which started in Los Angeles, is now owned by a Swiss company. Arco is owned by British Petroleum, Gerber, Carnation, Kappa Soup, Fox Net, come on now, if you don't watch Fox, you is a communist who should go back to Ruskies. It's a foreign, well, again, it's a multinational, but, but it's ba actually based in Australia. Rupert Murdoch, who runs Fox Network, is an Australian. Now, again, it's a, it's a, it's a multinational. See, the country... Many years ago, a, a, a gentleman by the name of Karl Marx <laughs> wrote that you know, companies, corporations, really don't have any allegiance to countries. And the, he was right. You know, the, the, and it's not that their corporations in and of themselves are bad. They just understand that the world is global. And it's going to take a while for countries and individuals in those countries to realize that there's only one world, folks, and we have to learn how to share it. Seagram's is based in Canada, Bayer is based in Germany, Vaseline is the UK, Friskies is from France, Trader Joe's is German. You've heard of Aldi, right? Aldi owns Trader Joe's. And they're kind of similar. 7-Eleven, now there's a real interesting story. 7-Eleven started as the Southland Corporation and uh, moved into Japan in the 1980s, I think it was and created 7-Eleven uh, of Japan. Well, it turns out that the Japanese love small, uh, small um, stores. And so 7-Eleven became you know, very popular in Japan, and very prosperous, and they turned around and bought the United States 7-Eleven. And I don't know if you followed or what's going on in Mexico, but they saw the success of OXO in Mexico, and now they're... Uh, doing their best to replicate that success in Mexico. You see 7-Elevens everywhere in Mexico. Now, Volvo and Saab, of course they're foreign. Well, actually, no. Wait a minute. Oh, come on. Give me a, well, give me a break. No. For almost 20 years, Volvo was owned by Ford and Saab was owned by GM, but they sold them after the global financial crisis. And so now Volvo is owned by, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, Chibi or Ch Cherry, Chibi. It's a Japan, I mean, Chinese, um, don't worry, they're still made in, in Sweden, but, but they're owned by a Chinese company. And Saab is now owned by a very tiny little um, uh, car, specialty car manufacturer, I think based in the Netherlands. But remember, Volvo and Saab both make you know, very large, important equipment, so they're not going anywhere, but they're no longer based in, 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 in Sweden. <laughs> so domestic or foreign? On this link, Visual Representation of the World Economy from visualcapitalist.com is a great graphic. I hope you take a look at it now. I can't really put it into the presentation without breaking some nasty copyright rules, so you're going to have to look at it yourself. But it, they did a really good job of showing you the world economy. And they update it roughly every year, so check it out. Very, very cool. And as we said, many people are worried, especially in the United States, they're, 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 there's a lot of um, uh, I, just angst, anxiety about, about us becoming a second-rate country. No, folks, we're still the largest economy. We won't be forever. Why? Because China has four, three and a half, four times as many people as we do. <laughs> and eventually India, which is with... with Three and, a half, three and a half times more people in the United States are going to, do, going to be bigger than us. And that's a good thing. I think so. I think so. Why? Because 
We want their people to be prosperous. We want them to have a, the life that we take for granted. Now, you might be thinking, oh, what is this touchy-feely, bleeding-heart liberal stuff? No! I want to make money! <laughs> I want to own companies that sell them shoes and Nike. I want to sell them toothpaste, uh, Colgate. I want to sell them cell phones and, and uh, uh, own the businesses that we all take for granted here in the West that have helped us thrive and have the most advanced standard of living the world has ever seen. No, you, you see, we want the rest of the, country, the world to do well because that means we are going to do well. Unless we blow ourselves up or die in our own waste or who knows what could happen. A, a meteorite, a tsunami, earthquake, yet another pandemia, disco could return. I mean, I mean, you laugh, but you didn't live through it. I did. It was a tough time. So, but as I said, I'm very optimistic that, uh, that assuming we learn to live with one another, which is a pretty big assumption, as we said, the political world it seems to be moving toward authoritarian rule and folks no matter what anybody said, no matter what anybody says, dictatorships do not make for good economies. The one exception has been China. I don't know how they pulled it off, but they seem to be. Uh, we thought 20 years ago when they entered the WTO, the World Trade Organization, that they would liberalize, and there's a there's a dirty word, liberal, but mean open this society up. But in fact, they've become more closed. At the same time, their economy has done really well. There are some people who are saying, no, no, you don't understand. It's going to, the whole thing's going to collapse. Uh, they're going to have their moments, just as we have our moments, and all countries have their, <laughs> their downturns. But mm, we'll see. We'll see. As I said, I'm very optimistic about the future, dear students. Very optimistic. So let's do a little bit more looking up the global investing world. These are the top 18 countries according to per capita income. And um, over the past some 40 years, who's done the best? These are per capita, not the largest economies, but per capita, meaning the, the wealthiest countries by individual standards. And you might be surprised that the United States is not the number one country. Sweden, the Netherlands, Denmark, Switzerland all beat us out. What? You tell me these commie countries that have socialized medicine have done better than the U.S.? Uh, yeah. Uh, notice the ones at the bottom of the list. Some countries that might surprise you. Japan, Italy. Why? What's going on in those countries? Why are those countries at the bottom of the list? Why have they done so poorly? Well, it has to do with demographics. These countries are losing people. They are, uh, they've experienced the demographic transition, which means people are just having fewer and fewer babies, in a very dramatic term, uh, dr dramatic uh, way. The United States has always increased our economy and our demographics through immigration. Now, how popular is that right now? That's how we've done it. So um, when anybody tells you that you know, socialist countries can't do well economically, you show them this graph and, and they might change their mind. But we're going to come back to this. Don't worry, folks. The story's not done yet. The story is not done yet. And by the way, the return of the stock markets in the developed world has been about 8.7% from 73 to 2013. Now, I got to update these numbers. I got to get these numbers updated. Um, not the best when it comes to doing the research for this stuff. And if anybody is, any data scientists out there want to help me, give me a call. Can you send me an email? Okay, now, uh, investments also are categorized by their... Uh, maturity, their, their length of time, your time horizon. Is it a short-term investment 
up to a year or so. Intermediate term, two to five years. Long term is anything five or more years. Now, these are general guidelines used throughout the industry. I tend to take a little longer view, which is more um, in the life insurance industry. This is the, 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 the one and above that we'll mostly use is the financial and investment industries, whereas the life insurance industry takes a little longer term view, and I tend to agree with them at that. Short term is one, two, even up to three years, depending on how important the, 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 uh, the goal is. Intermediate term, five, six, even seven years, especially if you're trying to save for a down payment on a home. Long term, seven years, 10, 20, 30 years. So that's the way I tend to think of in terms. But remember, it's up to you. And as we said, the industry, the financial and services, the investment services industry tends to use the first one. Before you make an investment, you must know your time horizon. In fact, that's, isn't that the most important discussion, most important aspect we have to think about? We need to know when we need the money. If we need the money in six months, don't put it in the stock market, folks. Ooh. But if you don't need the money for retirement, oh boy, you don't want it sitting in the bank paying nothing. You want to invest prudently wisely with an eye toward long-term growth of capital and income. And that's what we're going to concentrate on in this class. Very, very cool, in my humble opinion. Now, slide number 12 discusses the difference between a liquid investment and an illiquid investment. Huh? How much beer we have for the weekend? No, no. A liquid investment is an investment that is easily and quickly converted into cash. There is a ready market to purchase the investment and the change of ownerships happens quickly. So what are the examples? Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, real estate, investment trusts. Somebody's gonna buy your stock or buy, assuming it's a real bona, we use the term bona fide. It's not one of these penny stocks that nobody wants. It's, it's, a, it's a real company, a real corporation or a real bond. Um, illiquid investments, they may be difficult or sometimes impossible in the short term to convert them into cash. The market for the investment is small or change of ownership happens slowly or both. And the poster child for illiquid investments is real estate. It typically takes three, six, nine months to sell a real estate property. Now, some there are some times in the mid 2000s and I don't know, like now, where houses are selling really, really fast. But that's the unusual case. Usually it takes a few months. Partnerships, again, it might be difficult to find somebody to buy your partnership. And then collectibles. You, know, you are sure that this baseball card collection is worth, you know, whatever it is, $3,000. But you gotta find somebody who's a like-minded collector who will pay you that because most people wouldn't give you, you know, a few hundred dollars for the darn things. So that's the, idea of illiquid investments. And then the last category we'll take a look at that we'll spend the entire semester discussing is risk versus return. Risk is the chance that the actual investment re returns will differ from the expected returns. And that's not what we think when we think of risk. We think of uh, a possibility of suffering harm or loss or danger. But the industry says, no, 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 no. We're going to define risk by the, the uh, chance or the, the probability that your returns, your actual returns, would differ from the expected returns. In general, the higher the expectation of investment returns, the higher the risk level. So we thought we were going to get 10%. But the probability in any one year of getting 10% might be very low. We might get 17, we might get minus four, we might get uh, six or 22. Ah, you see, we're gonna do our best to give a number to measure risk, but the truth is we really can't. <laughs> you really can't measure the risks. You can just look to the past and use that as a guide toward the future. But 
It's imperfect, as we'll see. Uh, stick with us. The risk versus return spectrum. These are my guidelines, and I, and I think that the, uh, the industry tends to be a little bit more aggressive than I do. I think anything low risk is 3 to 5%. Now, that might even need to go lower because we're going to see that lower risk investments are actually paying less these days. Moderate risk, 5 to 8. Maybe we should change that to 4, 5, 6. Again, the world changes. High risk, 8, 9, 10%, 11, 12%. Yeah, we tell people when we get the stocks, we'll see. We tell them 8, 9, 10%. Although some have done a lot better. Some have done a lot worse. And then anything greater than 12% is speculative. And you'll hear people, as most notably the uh, better investing folks, which are you know, an awesome group, but they're shooting for 15%. Now, some of them do it, but a lot of them wind up with 10%, which is <laughs> I'm happy with 8, 9, 10%. So I consider, and others in the industry, anything greater than 12, that's speculative. And that's not investing. That is speculating. And you may do very well, especially if you, you know, can control your emotions and not panic. But you may do a whole lot worse. And we'll discuss, as we said, risk versus return in great detail uh, soon. So stick with us. So... Now that you've gone through those categories and those aspects, and you're going to study them over and over again, they're on the, uh, the, the study guide. Let's take a look at some examples. What type of investment is a Bank of America savings account? Is it a security or is it a property? Now remember, what's the difference between security and you know, property? Yeah, it's a security. It's a form of debt, not equity. You are lending your money to Bank of America, and they promise to repay the um, promise to repay the uh, the uh, principal and pay you interest. So it's actually a debt. I know we don't think of it as debt. We think, hey, we got money in the bank. Yeah, well, we're lending it to somebody, so it's a debt. Yeah. Is it direct or indirect? It's direct. Our name is on the account when we when we go into the bank. Is it domestic or foreign? Well, Bank of America is a domestic bank. It used to be based in San Francisco. Now I think that they're based in Charlotte, North Carolina. Is it short-term, intermediate-term, or long-term? We're going to find that savings accounts should be considered short-term because our money is guaranteed. We know it'll be there tomorrow, but at the same time, we're not going to get very much from our investment. Is it low, moderate, or high risk? Very low, very low. Um, because it's guaranteed by the full faith and credit of the United States. Actually, it's guaranteed by an insurance uh, entity that the government sponsors called the FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Banks pay into the insurance fund, and when a bank goes belly up, that's how the, that's how the deposit, to, the, the folks who deposit their money there, that's how they get paid. Is it liquid or illiquid? Very liquid. They will write you a check if you go in and say, I want to take my $77,000 out of the bank today. And they'll say, okay, we'll write you a cashier's check for it. They'll charge you five bucks for the cashier's check. But if you say, oh, I want it in cash, they'll say, <coughs> excuse us, <laughs> you have to come back tomorrow because they don't have that much cash hanging. You know, some, some branches do, usually in downtown areas, but no, most branches, they're not going to have that much cash. And then they're going to call up and say, we need, you know, $77,000 tomorrow. And by the way, we're going to contact the FBI because this is a suspicious, suspicious transaction. According to the Patriot Act, you've never come in with that much cash before. People say it's five, ten thousand $10,000. No, no. Then there's no one number. The bank, the credit union has to decide whether it is a suspicious transaction. Huh. <laughs> You come in for your own money, and now the FBI is looking at you. That's part of the Patriot Act that most people have no idea even exists. How about Nestle Foods, the world's largest manufacturer of foods, world's largest food company? Is it a security or property? 
It's a security. It's specifically a stock, which represents ownership in the corporation. So is it debt or equity? It's equity, right? We're part owners. Now we own a teeny little piece of the pie, but we are part owners. Is it direct or indirect? Well, typically it'll be direct because your name will be on the brokerage account where you bought the shares. So it's direct. Is it domestic or foreign? Well, where's Nestle based? It's based in Switzerland, but that's where they get their mail. They're another company, com yeah, another corporation, another company that's basically a country unto themselves. They're all over the world. No matter where you go in this world, you're going to be able to find Nestle Foods. Short term, intermediate term, or long term? Well, in general, we typically consider stocks long term, but a company like Nestle, we could think of it as intermediate term. You really do not want to hold stocks for the short term because there's always the possibility where they could fall 20% in a month, in a week. It's happened in a day. Uh, Warren Buffett says, if you're not going to hold the stock for 10 years, don't even think of holding it for 10 minutes. Is it low, moderate, or high risk? Well, generally, we like to consider stocks high risk. But again, it's Nestle, so moderate. Liquid or illiquid? Very liquid. Somebody will buy your shares of Nestle today and the transaction will occur very quickly. Now, Southwestern Community College, you've heard of them, right? <laughs> we put out bond issues, Proposition AA, Proposition R, to fix up the campus. And we'll discuss bonds in detail later on. It, that's how Southwestern Community College and the city of Chula Vista, the state of California, the United States government makes loans. They sell bonds. Bond investors are lending their money to the entity with a promise to repay the principal and interest until maturity. So is it, is it security or property? It's a security. It's a bond. It's a financial investment. Debt or equity? It's debt. We are lending our money to Southwestern Community College. Direct or indirect? Well, again, it used to be you get these bonds in, 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 in paper form, and that doesn't happen anymore. It's all electronic. And in the brokerage account, your name will be on the, the account. And so you are the uh, owner. So it is a direct investment. Is it domestic or foreign? <laughs> no, some people call us Tijuana Tech, but there really is a, an Instituto Tecnologico de Tijuana. So, no, we're based in Chula Vista, which is close to the border with TJ, but we're still a domestic entity. Short term, intermediate term, or long term? Well, bonds uh, can be considered intermediate term. Most people buy them for the long term, depends on the individual. They really shouldn't be considered short-term, although sometimes they can work as short-term investments, and we'll discuss why later on. Bonds that are close to maturity can work as short-term investments, but typically bonds are intermediate to long-term investments. Low, moderate, or high risk? Well, Southwestern Community College isn't going anywhere, dear students, and we would consider it moderate, maybe low risk, but it's certainly not high risk. Uh, in my humble opinion. Liquid or illiquid? Well, bonds in general are fairly liquid, although it turns out that people who buy bonds don't normally trade them as much as they buy, as they buy, trade stocks. So, so, so they are liquid, but you'll just sometimes find, have a hard time finding people who want to sell their bonds because they're happy with their bonds and they, they will uh, hang on to them. Whereas if you want to sell your bonds, usually, yes, if, if they're, you know, high high quality bonds, yeah, somebody wants to buy them. So they're fairly liquid in that respect, respect. But you just might have a hard time finding somebody who wants to sell them because everybody's happy with their bonds. They don't want to sell them. How about a duplex in Spring Valley? Rent one, live in the other. Not a bad real estate investment of, uh, um, uh, strategy. Security or property? Yes. Boom, it's property. 
It's real property, real estate. Is it debt or equity? It is equity. You are owner. You are the owner of the duplex. Direct or indirect, your name is on the title down at the county admin building. So it, it, you, it is a direct investment. Domestic or foreign, well, yes, Spring Valley is part of San Diego County, which is part of California, which is part of the United States of America. Short-term, intermediate term, or long-term? Well, in general, in my humble opinion, real estate should be considered a long-term investment. When you start to see, as we did in the mid-2000s and now, people buying uh, real estate in the expectation that it's going to explode over the next year or so, that's usually right before the fall. Now, how long it's going to take, one never knows. My buddy and I in 2005 and 6 were sure it was going to happen very soon. It didn't happen until 2008, so you just don't know. But, but no, real estate should be considered a long-term investment. Is real estate liquid? I'm sorry, is it high risk or low risk? Low, low, moderate or high risk? Well, in general, real estate, especially in an area that's as vibrant as San Diego, is considered moderate, but it could be, depending on the price you pay, high risk. I would not consider it a low risk investment. And why is that? Because real estate is a whole world unto itself and there's all kinds of uh, issues that a landlord has to deal with. And learning about those issues is very difficult from a book or a class. So as we'll say later, much later in the class, if you really want to get involved in, 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 in real estate, get a job in the industry. Uh, property manager, appraiser, um, some kind of a trade that you know how to fix the darn things. Uh, we'll discuss this later on. Liquid or illiquid, as we said, real estate is the poster child for illiquid investments. But there are times and there are areas like San Diego where they are very liquid. You put, a, put the ad up on Thursday, by Saturday you get <laughs> 5, 10, some people get over 20 offers, and then you sign the agreement on Sunday afternoon. But then it might take 30, 40 days for the transaction to actually happen. You might have heard of escrow. Now, what about Qualcomm Corporation? And by the way, it's supposed to be all uppercase, but I can't stand typing it that way because it just doesn't look right. But still, Qualcomm Corporation, it used to be a, a stadium, right? It's going now. Oh, no, 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 no. It's a company. It's one of the largest companies based here in San Diego, but they make more money outside the United States than they do inside the United States. Figure that one out. Is it a security or property? It's a security, it's a stock. You are part owner, so that's equity. Is it direct or indirect? Well, your name is on the brokerage account, therefore is a direct investment. Is it domestic or foreign? Well, it's based here in San Diego, that's where they get their mail. But as we said, they can make more money outside the United States than inside the United States. So yeah, what do you... <laughs> Is it a domestic or? It's a global multinational corporation. Short term, intermediate term, or long term? Well, again, stock should be considered long term, in my humble opinion, but in the ever fast changing world of technology, you might decide no, no, I'm going to hold Qualcomm just for this long, and then I'm going to get out while the getting's good. So you might consider it short or intermediate term, but I like stocks for the long term. Low, moderate, or high risk? Well, as we just said, it's in the high risk world, the high stakes world of technology. So it's fairly high risk. But is it liquid? Oh yeah, somebody's gonna buy, somebody's gonna want your 10 shares or 100 shares of Qualcomm. So don't worry about liquidity. Now, <clears throat> our last example. A loan to Uncle Harry. Yeah, every family has an Uncle Harry. Tio Lucas. <laughs> yeah, the black sheep of the family. Security or property? Well, it's a loan, so it's a security kind of. It's not very secure, though. Is it debt or equity? It's debt because you're lending the money in anticipation of being paid back. <laughs> Is it direct or indirect? Yeah, it's direct. You own it. Yeah, you're, you're stuck with it. Domestic or foreign? Well, last time we checked, Uncle Harry was still in the States, but who knows when you're going to get a postcard from somewhere else. Uh, short term, intermediate term, long term, or maybe infinity term. Low, moderate, or high, or speculative, or yeah, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. It's 
it liquid or illiquid? No, you're stuck with it. But somebody had to hum help Uncle Harry, right? No. Okay. What do you think, folks? Go back over this presentation. Make sure you understand the terms that we've created in the, that we've covered in this presentation. Look at the study guide. Uh, listen to it again. We try to make it. We try to make um, your time management the best it can be. You could while you're commuting, walking the dog, whatever. You could listen or watch on the treadmill. Uh, study, study, study. We want this to be the best class you've ever taken, and we want you to be the best investors the world has ever seen. So bring honor and glory to Southwestern Community College, to your friends, your family, and colleagues, and be awesome. In our next presentation, we will close in a little bit, a little closer. Not that close, but we'll still be, you know, um, at 30,000 feet as opposed to 40,000 feet and looking at the universe of investment alternatives, an overview of investment alternatives. Thank you so much again for being in our class. Be awesome, dear students. We are so proud of you.